Welcome to this bonus episode of the Sitcom Archive Deep Dive Overdrive. It's just me today. Al's not here. She's off buying some pampas grass for her next swingers party with uh, Margot and Jerry. So, actually, technically, it's not just me. That was a falsehood because I have a guest with us for this bonus pod. Jim from Fallacious Trump. How are you? Hello there. I'm good. Thanks. Good of you to join us. Just to give you a little bit of a hype up and an intro. Jim literally wrote the book on logical fallacies. That is accurate. Yeah. Logical fallacies um, come in many, many different flavors, but Jim's book is called Fallacious Trump, and the podcast is a yep. spin-off. Did the, the, the podcast come first or second? Yeah, no, the book came first, uh, and then the podcast was kind of born out of it, really, cool. and uh, decided to do an episode on each logical fallacy using... Trump, for examples, because he provides many, many examples. Well, he does, doesn't he? And um, yeah, and at the same time, we talk about British politics, uh, examples from that, and from popular culture as well. Well, I guess it's fun to laugh at Donald Trump in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. But the great thing about your podcast, which I'm quite a recent um, convert to, I only really discovered it about seven or eight weeks ago, but I've been binge listening since. Is um, not only not only do you get to laugh at this sort of twice impeached, umpa skinned moron, mm. who is thankfully an ex-president now. It's lovely to say that, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you also get to learn a lot about logical fallacies, and it actually helps me recognize when I'm doing it myself, now I've listened to s- several of your episodes. Yeah, it's really tricky to stop yourself. I mean, there's there's plenty that we go through that I still I still do myself, and it's just kind of, it's it's a natural part of trying to make an argument in any way, trying to persuade someone of something or trying to think through something that someone is trying to persuade you of. Mm. Um, And yeah, it's, it's useful when you do learn about them to kind of start trying to pick up on the, the common errors in logic that people make and, and that we make ourselves when we, when we don't think through something enough. Well, I guess some of them, some of them are incredibly effective, which the fact that Trump was ever elected is testimony to this. So it's easy to slip into them when they can work, even if they're not technically, uh, logically correct. (laughs) Yeah, they're really effective. And that's why they they persist really is, is, um, it's a great way, if you're not too worried about trying to kind of be honest and, and make a good argument. Uh, a lot of them are very persuasive and some are just kind of techniques that people use when they're making speeches and it's not necessarily a kind of a really negative thing mm. unless they value <laughs> honesty and and being upfront about stuff yeah i guess hyperbole being a classic example of something that you might use in a speech just for comic effect yeah um an appeal to emotion is a is a good one for that cuz um just uh, appealing to two people's emotions you know making people feel bad about something or good about something is a is a very good persuasive technique if you're using it to back up or use it as evidence to make a point then it's not it's not a logical way of going about it mm. but if you're just trying to kind of convince people to get behind a cause or something like that then it can be very effective it's when it becomes for political gain or for advertising purposes that it becomes nefarious, I guess, amongst other other reasons. Perhaps you might just, um, to people who are new to the concept of logical fallacies, and I'm, I'm by no means any sort of expert at all, I'm getting a lot better by listening to, to you guys mm. each week. Perhaps you could just demonstrate um, by example a couple of fallacies, perhaps using Trump as an example, the type of thing that you talk about. Sure. Uh, so a logical fallacy basically is just an error in reasoning that's been given a name because it comes up frequently enough to be talked about Mm. so there's lots of problems that people have in in trying to make arguments and and they back them up with points that actually don't necessarily lead to that conclusion Um, and when you are trying to make an argument what you need is premises in other words facts that you're basing it on and then a conclusion which is which logically derives from those facts okay um so one very common thing that Trump does a lot and uh, that is is a common fallacy is a, is called an ad hominem attack which is where instead of arguing against someone's point that they're trying to make you argue against the person ad hominem is just latin for to the man i see so you you say well you know don't want to listen to this this person or or whatever this person is saying is is wrong because you know they didn't even go to college yes um and that doesn't mean that their point is necessarily wrong. They're, they might be actually saying something which is true. 
and all you're doing is is trying to kind of take that person down you're you're arguing against the person rather than arguing against their point got you yeah i actually add that in mind as an example to say you might say in this in this podcast that just because i say something that margot says is a fallacy doesn't mean it is because i'm an idiot who doesn't know anything about logical fallacies <laughs> Yeah. Could be true, but also I might be correct. Absolutely. And I'm sure there'll be a yeah. little bit from column A and a little bit from column B. <laughs> and that's the thing about logical fallacies is is even if there is an error in the reasoning, it doesn't necessarily mean that the thing that's being said is not true. Sure. You can you can use bad reasoning and bad logic to back up your argument, and that doesn't necessarily mean the point you're making is wrong. It just means that your logic is bad. And so we should be trying to kind of use good reasoning and good logic to to back up the things we say yes yes it's a noble cause that you've got there definitely jim <laughs> i think um <laughs> i think if we can educate the world to to well we say it like some sort of grandiose statement like <laughs> i'm involved in any shape or form um i guess we'll move on to the fact that the reason i thought it would be good to invite you onto this podcast is that in rewatching the good life which is what our first series has been all about it's it's fairly transparent, even even prior to listening to your podcast, it's fairly transparent to me that Margot Ledbetter is a proponent of logical fallacies to to the nth degree. <laughs> uh, as well as ad hominem, she does a lot of um, hyperbole and various different ones that we'll, we'll actually show by example, I think, as we go through. Um, were you a fan of The Good Life? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I I grew up in the same village that Penelope Keith lived in, and in fact, still oh, lives wow. in, in Surrey, uh, Milford in Surrey. Yeah, so I I she I used to see her down at the local kind of grocery store as well. Really? But um, yeah, I was a big big fan of the Good Life. I uh, liked Felicity Kendall and Richard Bryce, obviously great. Well, we all liked Felicity Kendall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's a great series. Yeah. I noticed as well on your on your podcast that the, the section that you have the in, the fallacy in the wild you often cite sitcoms, uh, notably Friends. Yeah. Big fan of Friends. Yeah. You also did Yes <laughs> Yes Minister in one, I think, as well, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing is, uh, fallacies are often used in um, in a comedic sense because um, often the writers are using it deliberately, kind of not not necessarily trying to make a logical point, but but point out the flaws in a character's reasoning or make or you know set someone up for a fall. Sure. So comedy is is a, a kind of a good place to to look for com to for logical fallacies. I think typically as well in a sitcom there'll be there'll be conflict and that conflict will be magnified to the ridiculous de 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 degree and the laughable sure. proportions which is perhaps why it's a great source for highlighting outrageous, fallacious arguments, I guess. <laughs> good life, good life, good life, good life, good life, good life, good life. So, yeah, um, Margot, obviously, she's won, she, she's won countless polls as, as the greatest female sitcom character of all time. And I think we, we've explored in, in a past episode how she was almost Margaret Thatcher Manifest at one point. <laughs> and in fact, she may even have helped bring about Thatcher's win in the 1979 election. Yeah. Because of the fact that, you know, she was she normalised um, Thatcher to to the rest of <laughs> Middle Britain. Um, I mean, she's a great character to get stuck into. So I'm going to, I think we'll, we'll have a look at, you, you mentioned Ad Hominem already, so we'll just have a little play of um, a little rant that Margot goes on about Mr. Ives, the lascivious pottery tutor. <laughs> and then you can maybe talk us through what she's doing. <laughs> That so-called night school. A more precise term for it might be a breeding ground. What are they breeding? Familiarity and bad manners. Uh. Our so-called art master was a bearded young lout, young enough to be my... A young bearded lout with filthy feet who would insist on calling me Margie. A lout? <laughs> exactly. And that's why you left? Isn't that enough? No, not really, no. What's he like as a teacher? A poser. Do you know he's paid by the council? He strutted round that classroom with his Beethoven T-shirt and open-toed sandals like some left-bank gigolo. And when... Yeah? I asked him, very politely, Mr Ives, what size lump of clay do you think I should use? <laughs> do you know what he did, Jerry? He stared, quite unashamedly, at my breasts <laughs> and said... In your case, Margie, about a 36B. <laughs> so is this the case, Jim, that because she's saying he's paid by the council and that he's a poser, 
There's a little bit of both ad hominem and a little bit of something else in there, I suspect, as well. I think, yeah, it's mostly ad hominem. I think Jerry makes the good point of what's he like as a teacher, exactly, which yeah. is really, <laughs> really the question that, that he kind of asked initially. Um, and yeah, she, what she's focusing on isn't his teaching at all, but the, the kind of negatives that she sees him being too young, being a, you know, basically a hippie. Mm. Um, and, and those aren't quest, th- those don't factor into what makes him a good teacher. There is obviously, also some fair element to what she's saying if a if a teacher makes you feel uncomfortable sure in how uh kind of personal they are about your body or whatever yeah, it was like a bit that, much wasn't then, it? different times then, yeah <laughs> exactly um then it then it's reasonable perhaps to to not feel that they're a good teacher or not feel that they're the right kind of teacher for you and make that decision of whether, whether you want to stay in their class or not but but yes also the the points that she was mostly making are how he was dressed, how how young he was, the fact he had a beard, the fact he's paid by the council, are all about the man and not about his teaching. Sure. Okay. So that's a great example of an ad hominem, I think. And it's probably the um, logical fallacy that people know the most, I would suggest. Is that fair? It's a, Yeah, it's a very common one. It comes up a lot. Having said that, Margot also gets stuck into a lot of straw man fallacy work, I think. Uh, by all means, correct me if I'm wrong. Let me play a, a, a clip of of Margot castigating Jerry for something <laughs> that he didn't even do. As it is, I have to scour Bond Street for basically shoddy clothes, which are really only really fit for scarecrows. Good God, Margot! I mean, fifty-five pounds. Barbara buy three dresses for that money. Yes. What do you mean, yes? I mean that the homespun suits Barbara. I always thought you looked rather cute. Oh, I see. So you're married to a frump, are you? How on earth do you make that equation? I didn't make any equation, Jerry. You're the one who used the word. The word Trump never passed my lips. It didn't need to. It was written all over your face. So yes, uh, there's definitely something in what Margot says there that is completely inaccurate in terms of what Jerry is actually said to her, I think. Yeah. Uh, so a straw man argument is uh, comes from an idea where um, if you had to fight someone, for example, hmm. um, instead of fighting that person... Um, what you do instead is create a straw man, a scarecrow that looks like that person okay. and fight that instead because it's easier to knock down than the person themselves. And so a straw man argument is an argument that looks like what the person has said, your opponent, but isn't actually what they've said, but is an easier thing to argue against. Yes. And what Margot has done there is instead of arguing with Jerry about whether £55 is a reasonable amount for a, for a dress is to accuse him of calling her a frump. <laughs> it's a hell of a and, leap, isn't it? Yeah, and and like saying that that's actually was the argument he was trying to make and and therefore he she can argue against that because Jerry doesn't want to be seen as calling her a frump. So sure. he's likely to go along with her. It's a much easier argument for them to have because if she had to kind of defend her expensive taste in dresses then there's there's possibly more um, favour on his side in that argument. I don't know. I wouldn't go up against her in any sort of argument. I'm sure she would Still, find a way yeah. to win it. We've got. Um, we've actually got another example of Margot um, using uh, putting up a straw man to defeat. I'd sooner pay the electricity bills personally. I'd sooner you paid the electricity bills personally. <laughs> Meaning what, Jerry? When I come home from the office, sometimes our house looks like the Blackpool Illuminations. So you want me to stumble about in the dark, do you? I'm just saying you might consider the price of electricity sometimes. I'm very sorry, Jerry. Perhaps we ought to live in an almshouse and be done with it. You'd have made a marvellous photographer the way you enlarge everything. <laughs> That's a very <laughs> Coming from someone who's just forbidden me to burn a single electric light bulb in my own house. I'm just saying you might save it sometimes. For instance, when you're upstairs and you come downstairs, turn off the light upstairs. And fall down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Jerry, if you want me to fall down the stairs, why don't you just trip me up or loosen the stairs <laughs> or simply throw me bodily down and have done with it? Don't tempt me. <laughs> so, yeah, in, in that one, again, Again, uh, she's she's claiming that Jerry is saying things he isn't saying. She's claiming that he he wants you know his simple asking her to turn a light off when she's done in that area of the house. Pretty reasonable. Um, means yeah, means that um, he wants her to to fall down the stairs and die basically. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's yeah. It's not what he said. It's a much easier argument to to make. Um, she's also doing a thing here called appeal to ridicule, sure, which is taking your opponent's argument to a ridiculous conclusion which it which it, it wouldn't logically go to and saying look how stupid this point is 
and that's basically the point you're making yes and yeah he is that isn't the point he's making jerry actually gets a bit hyperbolic at the beginning as well when he says it, it's looking like blackpool eliminations but he's kind of using it in a way where we very commonly use hyperbole which is just to kind of make an emotional point isn't that a fallacy in itself by cliche or something that you've uh, yes i mean it's 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 part of it's part of the hyper hyperbole fallacy but i mean again just because someone is hyperbolic doesn't necessarily mean they are using fallacious reasoning we all say things like oh i've had the worst day ever true yeah um, yeah and and we don't mean that it's actually literally the worst day ever it's just we're expressing emotion in that way and it's and if we're not trying to use it to to make a point or win an argument or or provide evidence for something else we've said mm. then it's not actually bad reasoning yes I, f- I follow you i think yeah it was interesting i hadn't listened to your episode on appeal to ridicule but when you pointed out to me in, in the emails that we exchanged that she used it in this one i listened to that episode last night it was mm-hmm. a cracking episode and some ridiculous things that donald trump has, <laughs> has said in, in that particular fallacy <laughs> category if you if you want to dip into um jim jim's <laughs> podcast start with that one by all means because it's a cork <laughs> i really enjoyed it <laughs> Sticking with the hyperbolic fallacy, um, this is actually something that, that Margot does a hell of a lot, isn't it? There's a, a couple of other quick clips I'll play, play here in succession, which just demonstrate. Back to the liquid diet. Who's going to join me in a spot of Geneva gin? Please, Barbara? Mm, Margot, I will if you will. Yes, why not? Let's all get drunk. That seems to be Jerry's answer to everything. Oh, for heaven's sake. Is that, is that hyperbole again, would you say? Yeah, I mean... Uh, basically, the hyperbolic fallacy comes into play when you are trying to use a hyperbole to make a point, but it's it's when you don't really have enough evidence to back up it going as far as you're suggesting. Sure. So in in the co- the context of this clip is actually that she wants to somehow prevent the sale of the next door house to undesirables, and Jerry and the goods really could not give a shit about this issue because it's a non-issue, <laughs> um, and they just want yeah. to have a drink. And that's when she gets shitty with them, really. Yeah, and suggesting that Jerry's, um, you know, having a drink is an answer to everything, is is a kind of typical hyperbole. It's it's obviously not an answer to everything, and it's not. He's he's not even trying to use it as an answer. It's no. Not, he's he's not using it in that con- in that context in a way. It doesn't. He's not trying to solve the problem by having a drink, and she's kind of taking it to an extreme that she doesn't. She can't back up at all. And she's not the only character in the show who resorts to this type of. Um, Fallacy. Let's have a quick clip of Barbara doing something quite similar. Mr. Bet says Brian's got a lovely nature. Oh, good Brian. The horse's name is Brian. Yes. Oh, come and have another look at him, Tom. He's lovely. He might be lovely. He might be able to knit and do conjuring tricks, but he's just not a practical proposition, and that is a fact. But I don't want him as a pet. I'm not an idiot. He'd be a... He'd be a working horse. That is the point. There's not enough work for him to do to warrant his keep. I'm sorry, love. It's a nice idea, but it's just not efficient, is it? Is it? Don't know. Is it? Is it? No. Now, you know I'm right, don't you, love? Yes, I do, so shut up. Doorbell. Well, it must be if you say it is. You're the one that's always right. <laughs> Similar thing. So yeah, yeah this, this is. Uh, uh, I mean, the kind of thing we all do from time to time. Um, if you're annoyed with someone, kind of, yeah, you you use this as a kind of attack on on them. And yeah, it's not it's not logical to go from he's he's right about one thing to he's right about everything. But she's she's emotional and annoyed about it. <laughs> and who can blame her, Tom? As we've we've discussed discovered as we've been rewatching these is an absolutely awful character he's yeah, a he's horrible man being pretty patronizing at that point he, he's totally condescending and um he's always gaslighting her through the lens of a 21st century viewer he's sort of history's greatest <laughs> minister really as a, <laughs> a phrase i borrowed from a, a a guy called doug in an on another podcast when describing <laughs> him it's um he's not a nice man let's say he's not no Getting back to Margot, um, I'll play you another clip now, which I think is also hyperbole, but I think it's possibly also the wrong tool fallacy, which I don't know a lot about, but you maybe confirm or deny for me. I am not interested in your sister's dying yet. My only concern is that my Christmas tree is six and a quarter inches too short. Well, it doesn't really matter, does it? Ours is eight feet too short. (laughs) Of course it matters. 
that six and a quarter inches is a measure of the depths to which standards have fallen these days. So the context for that is is what? What is she oh, so, relating that to? Yes. So um, effectively, she's got a, a Christmas tree and it's six six and three quarter inches, six and a quarter inch too short. And she's saying that this six and a quarter inches is the measure of the depths to which standards have fallen this day, these <laughs> days. And she won't accept the Christmas tree because it's too short. Okay. So I, I perhaps erroneously thought this was wrong tool fallacy because you don't measure the standards of society <laughs> in inches on a Christmas tree. Is that fair? I think it's reasonable, yeah. I think it's the, the interesting thing with logical fallacies is that um, while there are some that were kind of, uh, kind of set in stone back in the days of Aristotle um, and, and that tended to be based in formal logic, which means that basically it, it, they're kind of syllogisms where if you get it, if, if it, um, transgresses the logic, then it's definitely wrong. Your conclusion can't be true if it doesn't follow the the kind of the laid out steps. Aside from those, most logical fallacies that people talk about are actually informal logical fallacies, which means that it very much depends on context, and means that if the logic isn't good, then it's it's more likely that their conclusion is invalid. But it's Got not necessary. Okay. It depends on the context. And the other thing about informal logical fallacies is they're just names that are given to errors that come up over and over again. So really anyone can come up with the names and just identify a, a regular problem. And the interesting thing about the wrong tool fallacy is is that it's actually one I identified for, for the podcast. Oh, so is it really? It okay. isn't one you'll find in other lists of, of fallacies. It's just something that in reading stuff that Trump said and, and looking at other sources, it's it's something that I saw coming up and people were using the the fairly classic example that, that we used on the podcast for that episode was the fact that Jared Kushner was talking about how successful his kind of Middle East peace plan was. And he said that I think he said it was like two hundred pages long and there were maps in it. Wow. Um, and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which isn't the, isn't how you measure how successful a peace plan is likely to be. <laughs> no. So, yeah, using the wrong tool to kind of measure how uh, how effective something is, or how useful it is, or how good it good the evidence is for your argument is is what that's all about. So yeah, in a way, Margot is using the kind of the the height or lack of height of her Christmas tree to to show standards across the board presumably in this case falling yes um yeah. and yeah she's she's probably not using the right tool for that oh well i'm glad that i kind of got that right even though it's not a recognized fallacy it's more of a gymism i think is it yeah <laughs> it's it's what well you know when they when they write more books in the future about logical fallacies maybe they'll include it who knows yes maybe you can get a cut of the cut of the money on that one yeah every time someone says it there's a fiver coming your way or something something like that I'd like to just play you this this clip now, Jim, which I think is possibly either the slippery slope or the thin end of the wedge fallacy. Do you want to brief, briefly just say what those fallacies are? And then yeah, I'll... I mean, they're essentially the same, uh, just different names for the same fallacy. A, a slippery slope is where someone says, if this negative thing happens that I'm against, then it'll end up in something that everyone agrees is bad. Okay. It's often used for things that that people are either against politically or religiously, like say gay marriage. People say, "Oh, if you let gay people get married, then family will break down." You know, people will want to marry animals and and <laughs> things like that. People already um, want to marry animals. <laughs> people are strange. So, yeah, but um, so it's it's yeah, it's used to say we can't we can't take this small step. If we take this small step in a in a negative direction, as far as I'm concerned, then all hell will break loose and it'll just get gradually worse and worse and worse. Okay, well, let's see if this clip where Margot um, is giving Jerry some grief is an example of that fallacy. I'm beginning to doubt myself now, but you can you can affirm or deny that this is the uh, the slippery slope fallacy after we've played it. Well, anything happened while we were away? Oh, yes, your allotment came through. Ah. An allotment of what? Earth. The sort of things you see from railway carriages. It's next to mine. Well, thank you very much, Jerry. I see the real reason for that second bottle of champagne at the Krasnopolsky now. Sweeten me up before you tell me you're going to be late for every single Sunday luncheon from now on. Why should I be? I am not a fool, Jerry. I know about allotments. They are places where men go to sit in silly little sheds so they don't have to talk to their wives. <laughs> Brick 
by brick, she is building a madhouse. Look, if you don't want to talk to me, Jerry, at least have the courage to look me straight in the face and say, shut up, Margot. Shut up, Margot. What do you think? Yeah, so uh, there's a little bit of straw man in there, suggesting that actually Jerry doesn't want to talk to her at all. But yeah, I do think it's a slippery slope because she's suggesting that the simple act of getting an allotment, which Jerry might have multiple reasons for, um, will inevitably lead to him being late for every Sunday meal mm. from now on. And and the point with slippery slopes is usually the first step won't inevitably lead to further negative steps. Sure. Um, and it's perfectly possible for Jerry to have an allotment and just you know tend it occasionally or use it for growing leeks or whatever, and and not actually spend all of his Sundays there. Well, she does back down, actually. Um, if we played that clip on a bit more, he was only getting the allotment for Tom to extend his um, growth of soft fruits. So she right. was going off at the deep end, as usual, without any real cause for which to do so, which is typical Margot, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Let me play this one to you, if you're not getting fed up of all of these clips of Margot <laughs> Ledbetter. I think this is a guilt by association fallacy whereby Margot is blaming Jerry for all of mankind's chauvinisms through the ages. I tell you this, Jerry. The male animal has a lot to answer for. <laughs> what have I done now? All of you. Down through the ages, and it's the woman who always suffers. You drag her along behind you like a mere thing, an object, a chattel. Okay, sit down. Don't interrupt, Jerry. <laughs> Just put that hi fi equipment away and make the coffee. Anything you say? <laughs> Chattel. <laughs> I'm beginning to think I'm wrong on this one, am I? Um, I think there is an element of guilt by association in there. Really what guilt by association is, is connecting two things that are similar in one way. Yeah. Um, and assuming that they then are similar in multiple different ways. So so you, you pick uh, a person who is who is very negative who everyone agrees is negative and say well you know this person had an association with them in some way they were a friend of theirs or they were a colleague of theirs or they were in the same political party as them or they enjoyed the same kind of evening meal as them and and therefore that person is also bad you're you're associating two people and then saying they share the negative traits as well as whatever trait you can prove they share so is this is this the type of thing that happened a lot with Jeremy Corbyn, whereby the photographs would be unearthed of him shaking hands with whoever, an IRA. Yeah, absolutely. Or... Jerry Adams, for example, yep. of, of Sinn Féin, who, who at various points was, was a legitimate politician mm. in a, a recognised political party, and at other points was arguably a terrorist. Um, and, and so, yeah, they kind of, they, they looked at photos of the two together and said, look, he was consorting with a known terrorist mm. when, Actually, he may have been a, a kind of legitimate politician at the time. Yeah. We should almost rename it the Jimmy Savile fallacy because there's plenty of people who've been yeah. photographed with, with Jimmy. Absolutely. Who now regret being photographed with Jimmy, I think. So in this case, Margot is, is a kind of associating Jerry with the negative traits of men throughout history <laughs> in, in that same way, simply because he's also a man. Um, you could say this is also either... A, a hasty generalization fallacy where she's taking kind of uh, essentially a small amount of of evidence of a man i don't know the, exactly the context for this clip mm. but but talking about a situation where a man was uh behaving in a negative way and just generalizing that out to all men pretty much um, that is what she's doing really yeah. i mean she's tom has done something that's upset her and she's lashing out in jerry's general direction <laughs> <laughs> Understandable. Yeah, the poor guy he puts up with a lot. Can we just? Can you perhaps just give us a brief overview of the appeal to emotion and the appeal to flattery fallacies before I play this next clip, which is a belting clip of Margot politicking her way into a job, well, politicking Miss Mountshaft out of a job so that she can get <laughs> into the job and slip into those shoes, and she does it in such a in such a clever, manipulative way that she almost paints this um, this election for the Music Society as, as, as an act of kindness, in, as a way of ousting Miss Mountshaft. In fact, let me play the clip and then you can talk about the fallacies. That probably makes more sense, doesn't it? Sure. Well, as I seem to have the floor, there are just one or two remarks I should like to make. Firstly, I did not seek office. 
It is simply that I seem to have been chosen as the standard bearer for those of us who seek to put a more professional gloss on our productions. Yeah. Here, here. Oh, now, let me touch on Dolly Mountshaft for a moment. Here we go. Vilification. No, Mr Chipchase. Admiration. No one is more aware than I of how much Dolly Mountshaft has put into this society. And no one is more aware of the awful toll it has taken on her general health, her nerves, and her voice. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if at this moment Dolly were not sitting in some taverna with her bottle of ouzo, almost wishing that she loses this election. She doesn't even know about it. <laughs> and if I am chosen to take up the tiller of our little ship, I shall do so humbly. And in so doing, I shall call upon all of you to wish dear Dolly a happy harbour in the back row of the chorus. Where are you going, Jerry? It's quite a, quite the speech, though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and as I mentioned, uh, the appeal to emotion is is a useful rhetorical tool when you are just trying to generally sway an audience in one direction. Mm. Um, when when you start trying to use it to back up arguments or or pretend that your facts are based on more evidence than they actually are that's where it becomes fallacious and there's it's a kind of gray area and i think it's it's difficult to say exactly what is happening here it's uh, it i would say that margot isn't being completely sincere here and in that respect (laughs) uh yeah um so in that respect the 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 um the use of emotion to to try and sway the people that she's talking to and and saying look you know we need to think about Mrs. Mountshaft's health and and so on is is not at, is it's kind of she's using it disingenuously, and in the same way the appeal to flattery uh, is often used when you're talking to an audience and you kind of want to say, well, you know, I know you people are very smart and and obviously smart people will agree with me that this thing is true, and no one wants to feel like they're not smart, so they'll go ahead. So if you kind mm. of flatter them first and say, you know, obviously people who are intelligent people who who care about their fellow man will will think this in a way to try and get people along to to believe the same things you believe and she's kind of doing that in a way she's saying you know i know you'll agree with me that this has taken a toll on her and so if if you care about her basically is what she's saying you, it's should, subtext, you should vote her it? out it's sort of very yeah. subtle and very clever she could almost have gone on to be Mrs. Thatcher herself in the in the yeah. in the fake political world. She's very good at that politicking and getting her own way around the pony club and the the music society. Yeah. Bravo, Jerry. Uh, the probably probably the last one that I just want to run run past you, Jim, is um is an example of post hoc ergo propter hoc, which um, you can translate for me because <laughs> my Latin yep. isn't, isn't great. <laughs> so yeah, post hoc ergo propter hoc is is after the thing, therefore because of the thing. Right. And uh, it's used when people confuse correlation with causation. They confuse the fact that one thing happened and then another thing happened, and they assume the second thing was happened by the first thing. Sure. Especially if that's the way it's portrayed to them. And it's very common, isn't it, in politics and in in the media? It's also also an extremely easy trap to just, just to fall into naturally. People... People uh, seek patterns, essentially. Your brain is a very effective pattern-seeking machine. And, you, and so when you see um, a, a set of situations and then an outcome, mm. you immediately kind of you, – you have a tendency to think that that outcome came from those, those situations that you saw before when it necess- wasn't necessarily caused by that. And sometimes those two things were caused by an unseen third cause. Yes. So – is it is it fair to say that this is very popular amongst the tin hat community with their sort of conspiracy theories? It's it's extremely useful for conspiracy theory thinking. Yes, because all you need to do is show that two things happened kind of uh, you know one thing after the other mm. and then you can make the assumption or you can make the implication that one thing was caused by the other. So the the coronavirus happened and Bill Gates got richer. Coincidence? That type of thing. Yeah. Yeah or yeah, there's there's just so many so many arguments that you can make with it. It's very it's a very handy one for for kind of pointing people in in an odd direction. Okay, so um, we've got an example of Margot doing this. I think I think this is a good one. Early caller, an emissary from the music society. 
Miss Mountchamp's brother-in-law with a steel plate in his head. <laughs> what do you want? Some metal polish? <laughs> no. Having successfully proved to be the society's most inept producer, he is now trying to show an equal non-flair as our costume designer. I thought you should be the first to see our costume designs, Mrs. Ledbetter, as we already think of you as our own sweet charity, little sycophant. <laughs> and worse, a deviant. Oh, what's he drawn? See for yourself. Hmm. All right. Not very well drawn, but all right. All right. Costumes like these are fit only for some back alley striptease club. <laughs> They're just dresses. Oh, these dresses. Slits and frills and plunging necklines. Dustbin designs. <laughs> and from a dustbin mine. It's that steel plate, I think. It's making it fun. <laughs> yes, that's a strange um, connection to have made, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, so she knows that he's got a steel plate in his head and that he's drawn these, what she considers to be kind of lewd outfits. Mm. And, and yes, makes the connection that probably the... The latter is because of the former, when actually they probably don't have anything to do with each other at all. No, that's par for the course, I think, with Margot. I think we could probably pick out umpteen other examples of her using the uh, the post hoc ergo propter fallacy, but you've already given us a, a lot more, a lot of your time than uh, I expected you to. I just wanted to run past um, you some some. I've already mentioned that Tom Good is history's greatest monster, <laughs> um, and therefore some of the fallacies that he comes out with are. Yeah, different. I, spe- I guess one of the fallacies that we haven't covered, of which there are many, and that's how you've managed to get 70-odd mm-hmm. episodes of a podcast out of this subject, I guess. Um, <laughs> but one of, one of the fallacies that Tom has used is the special pleading, which I wasn't really aware of until you flagged it with me. And there's an episode that we haven't covered yet in the podcast where Mrs. Weaver, the next-door neighbor, moves away and leaves behind a tanker full of oil. And it's just sitting there. So Tom really wants to use it but it's not his and he's having a hard time justifying the theft of this oil to Barbara Um, let me play the clip and then you can explain a little bit about special pleading it's that oil in Mrs Weaver's tank you see what about it? well must be worth quite a lot of money I mean say 200 gallons well what's that worth these days? no idea about 100 pounds at least I say yes so? (laughs) it's just lying there well, there's not much else oil can do, is there? Well, it's just lying there. Mrs. Weaver obviously didn't want it, or she'd taken it with her. Well, of course she didn't take it with her. I don't suppose removal firms are equipped with tankers. So whose is it, then? Well, it isn't ours. It would be if we siphoned it off. You can't have an honest swap. If you've stolen the oil in the first place. I don't like the word stolen. Well, what would you call it? A choir. But if we siphoned it off at night, no one would ever know. So he's trying to justify this nefarious act by the virtue of the fact that there'll be no... There'll be a victimless crime, I think. Is that fair? I mean, I th- yeah, he's saying that, that they won't get caught, basically. Yes, <laughs> That's kind yeah, of the yeah. main the main argument he's trying to make. Um, and there was another clip, I don't know if you want to play it, that, that kind of really drives the, the fallacy home. And, and I think in context, the two of them work together very well. Yes, there is something. That oil. Oh, Tom, I thought we'd settled that. We have, but there's been a development. What? Some filthy swine has been pinching it. <laughs> How do you know? I've just been to check the gauge. It's, it's nearly half gone. The whole thing's halfway down. Well, who could that be? I don't know, but I think it's disgusting. <laughs> well, you were all ready to pinch the stuff yourself last night. That's quite different. I had a worthwhile motive, the care and comfort of our pigs. Well, I suppose whoever else is pinching it has got a worthwhile motive. They're hardly likely to drink it. Well, they're not getting any more of it, I'll tell you that. Why? Because we are. Oh, you can justify that now, of course. Yes, I can. What source for the goose is, is, is gander for the other? <laughs> Why should we sit about being all fine and good when someone else is pinching the stuff? So, so yeah, those two clips together, I think, really sell this this fallacy because special pleading is is basically double standards. It's about having a rule that you think should be generally applicable, or at least you tell people that you believe should be generally applicable. In this case, 
stealing is bad basically mm. and and the the reaction that he has to the fact that other people have been doing it is um showing that he he thinks generally it's not okay but when you then break that rule yourself making up excuses for why it's okay for you to do it yes um, which is exactly and, what he's doing isn't it yeah absolutely and it, again it's a common political thing because people say you know people in the in the other party are um doing this thing which i disagree with and then the the politician inevitably does it themselves and they say well yes but i wasn't doing it for the for the same reasons that they were or they make up excuses yeah. they come up with a reason why it's okay for them but it wasn't okay for someone else to do like driving to bernard, bernard castle to test your eyes that kind of thing yeah yeah, mm. yeah. okay uh <laughs> yes that's um <laughs> Probably a classic example, I suppose, isn't it? Fresh in everyone's mind. That was, I think, after we did the special pleading episode, that came out. So That's a shame. We couldn't include it, yeah. We've got one last one from Tom, um, which is a one... Oh, I don't know how to introduce this. We've got one last clip from Tom. <laughs> Jim, why don't you tell us about what this um, fallacy is? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, this is a really very specific version of the guilt by association fallacy. If you remember, the guilt by association was where you, you choose a, a, a negative person and associate the person that you want to seem negative with them. Or, or you, you kind of connect two people that share one trait and claim they share all their traits or all the negative traits. Uh, and this is a very specific one called reductio ad Hitlerum. And it's about saying that someone's like Hitler because they do one thing that is like Hitler. In some cases, people will say, you know, Hitler was a vegetarian or a teetotaler or like dogs. Or an artist. Um, and, and, yeah. And, and so by if you say, well, you know, this person can't be that bad, they're a vegetarian, and then you say, well, Hitler was a vegetarian, you're kind of implicitly suggesting that that person is a bit like Hitler mm. in a way. So, Is it a fallacy, yeah, though, because they are a bit like Hitler? It is a fallacy because you're implying that they like Hitler in other ways as well. Yes. Um, Without actually having said it, it's sort of a, a subtle yeah. thing. Uh, one example we used, we haven't actually discussed this fallacy in detail, but it came up in another episode. Uh, we used a clip from King of the Hill, I think it was, where uh, someone was um, asking someone not to smoke, basically. And, and the argument that the person came back with was, you know who else was against smoking? Hitler. <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah it's it's actually surprisingly common it comes up from time to time in, i suppose it works hand in hand with godwin's law does it is it godwin's law? It, very much so yeah. yeah it is godwin's yeah which says that the longer the argument goes on online the more likely someone is going to refer to hitler basically right or compare the other person to hitler well let's hear tom um using the reductio ad hitlerum is that how you say it yeah that's right to um put mr carter from the residence association on the back foot when Margot is complaining about him keeping pigs. Good evening, Tom. Good evening, Margot. This is Mr. Carter. Evening, Mr. Good. Good evening, Mr. Carter. Right, that's got the poncy formalities over. I'm a busy man. If you'll just make your threats, I'll ignore them and you can clear off. No threats. I just want to have a chat. That's what Hitler said at Munich. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's pretty much demonstrated exactly what you said there, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so by suggesting that... that um, Hitler also just wanted a chat, but then turned out obviously to be much worse. He's suggesting that Mr. Carter is also going to turn out to be much worse than just wanting a chat um, in in the same way that Hitler was, which is, you know, uh, probably overblowing it a bit. Yeah, I think if anything, Margot was probably more the Hitler in this in his actual yeah. episode. Is there also another type of fallacy in there? Because Hitler didn't just want a chat, did he? <laughs> in Munich. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I mean, it may be what he claimed. I don't know. I'm not that up on the history of that. But um, yeah, it's, it, possibly that was when uh, when he met with Neville Chamberlain. or, or Oh, yes, I suppose he could be referencing accord. that. Yeah. So, so that, that yeah, may have been saying that then after the chat came much worse stuff. So, sure. Yeah. So by equating the two, he's, he's making a, 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 a false analogy of uh, an unfair comparison, specifically reductio ad Hitlerum. So, we'll just end, I think, with... Uh, I'm going to sort of turn the tables on Jim. There's a, there's a part of his podcast that he does with, uh, with Mark where he reads out three quotes from Donald Trump and his co-host Mark has to guess which one of the quotes is not genuine. That's right, yeah. I I'm, I'm find two ridiculous things he said and make up another ridiculous thing 
And uh, yeah, Mark has to figure out which one I made up. And it's a lot harder than it sounds because Trump says so many ridiculous things, so many unbelievable things, that it's really difficult to pick. And you do a very good job of coming up with things that are sort of in his um, style of, in, in his oratory style, shall we say. Yeah. I mean, they all sound stupid and something that no one could possibly have really said. So yeah, um, I'm not I'm not running out of examples anytime soon. And they're all fallacies as well, aren't they? You try and make them examples I mean, of fallacies. Th- th- some, yeah, they're, they're not all of them. A lot of them are just kind of ridiculous things, mm. but some of them incorporate fallacies as well, yeah. Well, what I've tried to do here is get three quotes from Margot, which are fallacies. I think the fallacies, you can correct me if I'm wrong, and you, and I'll read them all out and you can guess which one is the fake news Okay. from 1977. So, <laughs> um, okay, so the first one for you. Shall I, I don't know if to do it in Margot's voice. Maybe I should do it in Trump's <laughs> voice. <laughs> um, no, I'll just read it. If this country hadn't lost its collective mind at the last general election, we wouldn't now be forced into tolerating such outlandish Marxist beatnik degenerates. <laughs> and that's a quote from Margot objecting to okay. the communal hippie movement. And I would say that's a counterfactual fallacy. Yes, that's fair. The second quote is, I hope you're still laughing when the value of property in this district sinks to an all-time low. This is a residential area, not a tradesman's ghetto. This is Margot equating selling veggies in the street to a slump in the housing market, which I guess is thin end of the wedge. An appeal to fear, maybe? Yes, appeal to fear, probably, yeah. yeah. Okay, and the third quote I've got is, I was foolish enough to assume that the principle of customer satisfaction had not been entirely swept away in the lava stream of trade union hysteria. <laughs> when she doesn't get uh, something delivered, she, uh, she blames the trade unions. So, okay. is that what type of fallacy would that be? Um, I'm not sure there's a, there's a fallacy in there so oh. much as apart from just hyperbole, perhaps. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's going it's over the top. But I don't think she's necessarily making an argument specifically. Maybe she is in claiming that that customer service has entirely been swept away. Mm. Yeah, probably just hyperbolic, really. Okay. Uh, which can cover a lot of. <laughs> uh, a lot of sins and as we discussed it earlier it's easy it's easy to think that hyperbole is a fallacy when in fact it's just being used as a almost a device to make your point yeah 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 if if you're not trying to provide evidence or a, make your argument stronger or, or persuade someone of something being true that's the the point there has to be a truth claim in there okay which again, like the the example of I've had a I've had the worst day ever. You're not really trying to make a make a truth claim. No, no. There, yeah, you're yeah. just you're just saying, oh, I'm, you're accentuating how bad your day has been. That's through all. the use of an idiom. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so do you want me to read them again? Or are you happy with those? Oh, I think no. I think I'm I think I'm good. It's tricky to know which one might be made up, but I'm leaning towards number two. Um, and I, I'm not sure I could tell you why specifically, but I think that's the one I'm going to say is is not real. Okay, so I'll do this in the style of you when you're when you're dealing with okay. Mark. In reverse order, then you think that number three <laughs> was real? Yes, I think number three is real, and number three is real. I was foolish enough to assume that the principle of customer satisfaction had not been entirely swept away in the lava stream of trades union hysteria. (laughs) That one was real about the uh, the lava stream of trade union. Number two, you think this is the the fake news, the fake Margot. Fake one, yeah. Okay. Number two, I'm afraid, was made up by me. No, that's not right. (laughs) Number two is real. (laughs) Say that again. Oh, I thought I'd won. No, you haven't. I've got that wrong. Thank you. Number two, I'm afraid, is real. Please laugh. Go on, laugh. I hope you're still laughing when the value of property in this district plummets to an all-time low. Why should it? This is a residential area, Barbara, not a tradesman's ghetto. Oh, don't be such a snob. Okay. I'd cut that up completely. Well, well done. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Yeah, I, f- I filled you with that one. Okay. So the one I made up was um, the first one, which is, if this country hadn't lost its collective mind at the last general election, we wouldn't now be forced into tolerating such outlandish Marxist beatnik degenerates. <laughs> it is something Margot would have said. See, the Marxist thing almost almost got me. But yeah, no, I, I, uh, 
Yeah, yeah, it did sound like her. So, is this your first time playing the game, Jim? It is from this side. Yes, absolutely. Got some sympathy with Mark now. Uh, many, many episodes uh, where I'm I'm the one asking the questions. But yeah, I, I see how difficult it is now, and uh, maybe I'll be a bit softer on Mark. I think you should. But, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but as to your point of that, that first one is a good example of the counterfactual fallacy. Right. And that uh, counterfactual is basically when you claim how something would be if situations were different when you don't actually have any evidence for that. Hmm. That's what I thought when I made it up anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what I was going for, so I'm glad yeah, I got, you got it that right. right. <laughs> well, thanks a lot for joining us, Jim. It's been really interesting, and I think it's quite educational as well to look at Margot through the lens of these logical fallacies that she employs. Do you want to maybe just sell yourself and tell us a little bit about the podcast and your book and where it can be bought, etc.? Uh, well, the book's available in uh, basically any way you can buy books, pretty much, mostly on Amazon, but also certainly in America in, in actual bookstops. And it's it's called Fallacious Trump, the Donald J. Trump Guide to Logical Fallacies. And uh, it covers about kind of 30 of the main, most common ones. But, uh, but the podcast... Uh, is is free so if you want to listen to that instead and you can get all of the same information plus more basically you haven't thought this but through you have, have you, mate? To, <laughs> you you have no you have to you know it takes a long time to listen to the whole thing so you might want the book to have it all in in kind of just an easy digestible form mm. but yeah the, the podcast can be found um anywhere you find podcasts uh, you can go to fallacious com um to to find all of the show notes and the other details but yeah it's uh it's all over apple and stitcher and those kinds of places I haven't bought your book myself, but I do intend to. I just don't want to buy it through Amazon. So I'm waiting until deliveries are working properly <laughs> again in this country because I'm trying not to line Jeff Bezos' pockets at the moment. Fair enough. So, yes, um, I, w- one last thing I was going to ask you was that now that Trump's sort of gone from politics, or more to the point now that he's been deplatformed by Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and everyone, Will you be forced going forward to cater to the sort of more right wing audience and and go down the fallacious Biden? <laughs> um, I don't think we will be doing that. Um, at the moment, we're just sticking with Trump because he's not really going anywhere. No, um, no. he's been quiet for the last week or so. But, Must be killing um, him. His yeah. Um, he, there's already talk that he's trying to start a new political party, hmm. and and if we've got the impeachment trial coming up. And uh, depending on how that goes, he may even still try and run again in 2024. Mm. If he doesn't, it's possible that one of his kids will. So I think oh, there's God. still quite a lot of work to be done in um, <laughs> in fighting against that kind of evil. So yes. we're, we're on board for it. And I'm sure that Donald Jr. and Ivanka and the one he doesn't acknowledge also come out with uh-huh. lots of um, fallacious <laughs> statements. So if they run, yeah. your cup runneth over. It won't be tricky to uh, to, to keep going. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thanks. It's been fun. We'll be back, uh, as usual, on Tuesday with another another regular episode if Al can pull herself away from the swinging party. I'll see thee. Welcome to this special bonus episode of Fallacious, not Fallacious Trump, that's your fucking podcast. (laughs) I've taken over yours. I'll try that again.